Hey there. I, let's see here, hold on, just see if I can, I want to address the teaching of justification that comes out of treating James as apostolic. And this is really important. This is the crux of the issue for me. I don't believe that you can accommodate James the way people are doing it without ultimately overthrowing Paul. People try to throw this under the rug and say that James is not a big deal. And I've said it can be a secondary issue, but whatever you do with James, you can't use him to overthrow Paul. And we have p groups that directly, outright overthrow Paul with their teaching from James. And that would be like the Hebrew Roots or the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Seventh-day Adventists. Or the, there's so many different groups that just outright deny justification by faith in a much more straightforward way. And then there's other complicated things. Think about the hyper-dispensationalists with all their charts. You know where all their charts come from? Because they believe that James is teaching a different gospel for the Jews that is works and that there were two gospels. So then I've said in the past that the safest thing you can do is say, and what I mean by safest, free from all controversy, is to say James is just saying, let your faith be shown before men. Let it be profitable. And in fact, that was his motive. His burden was pastoral. He's not an apostle. He is treating a practical issue of saints who were not taken. This was about the time in Acts 5 where there was a, a thing arising about the Greeks and their needs not being met and widows' not needs being met and Jews eating first. This was faith of Jesus with respect of persons, which he says is sin. So he is addressing a practical matter. Okay, that's very simple. But he used theological language and that theological language, and we're only talking about a few verses, has literally, for some reason, shaped the course of church history. It's amazing. Why four verses? Why four verses causing this much issue? And anybody who says that they've never struggled with this as a believer is either lying to you or has a seared conscience or isn't saved. <laughs> a seared conscience meaning they have no more feeling anymore about, they don't remember as a new believer, all the attacks on your assurance. And of course that's not true. Of course they do because otherwise why would they have these complicated explanations for James? They're gaslighting you when they tell you that there's no problem between James and Paul. That's gaslighting. Because they're saying then that's your problem. It's not James's fault or the Bible's fault or anybody's fault that James says something completely the opposite of what Paul says. That's your fault for noticing. <laughs> that's what they're doing. So a lot of people, that's just the route they take. What? There's no difference. Now these people either are gaslighting you or insensitive they don't know Paul's ministry. They don't know what justification is. And they don't even understand why this is wrong. But then there's other groups who are literal wolves in sheep's clothing, false brethren crept in unaware, who are seeking to spy out people's liberty. And have, for the unfortunately, in many cases, run the seminaries. But, so there's a whole gamut of people who are treating James. Okay, you got to do something with it. What did Luther do with it? He didn't put it in his canon. He put it in the Apocrypha. And people get all freaked out about that, but they don't understand that there have been many different versions of the Bible over thousands of years where people have decided books are in or books are out. And it's based on whether they, based on their understanding of the testimony of Christ. And it's not always accurate because there's books in uh, the Catholic Bible that shouldn't be there. And the Protestants figured that out these books don't agree with the testimony of Christ. And there was a big question mark about James. There's been a lot of different councils about this. <laughs> to, I, I, it, it, the, the, we're just not, people are just not aware of the church history. To treat this as this, if it's just so controversial, somebody said, said on my wall, I've never in my life ever heard a believer say what you just said about James. Okay, I'm sorry, you should read more. It is true that I haven't met people who get into these things either, but they're not reading. They're watching YouTube and watching TV and using, and I'm the same. I'm not reading as much as I used to 20 years ago. I used to read constantly. Part of it's my eyes going bad, but we're not well read. We're not literate. We don't know history. 
So this all sounds new to people's ears, especially if they've grown up in the institutional churches. But this is not something new, okay? As to what Bible, what books are in the Bible? What? How do we know that? It's not written on a, a mountain in letters of fire, what books are in Bible. God actually lets men have the privilege of approving of his testimony, believing it and setting their seal that it's true. That's how we got our Bible. There's a human element and yet God is sovereign. So I'm not going to say he didn't protect or order the steps of the people who did it and all of that. But you have to consider the human element. Okay, so the whole thing about James is that one of the ways that people have tried to accommodate it in, in maybe a good motive to begin with was to teach that James is teaching about another kind of justification. He's using the word differently than Paul does. That all sound, and they'll say it in a very reasonable way and I want to show you the exact example. Somebody came on my wall and he said, yes, I have gone full circle on this teaching. I respectfully disagree with you. James' teaching is primitive. He was thinking in terms of practical Christian virtue, not exactly, he was speaking about a pastoral concern. James says we are justified by works, but he uses the word justification, justified, differently than Paul. Justification for Paul is the moment we are made forensically right. Okay, that's a seminary term, and it, and it implies some things. Forensically right with God by faith alone. James doesn't speak to this. No, he does not. For James, justification is written for a saved person. God acknowledges and rewards righteous living and service action done in faith. Two legitimate uses of the one ordinary word before it was theologically loaded. Now, when was it theologically loaded? Okay, we didn't load the word with theological meaning. The ascended Christ did through Paul's teaching. So there, the, the, don't say theologically loaded when you talk about justification and try to say that James's teaching is a theological instruction. You can't have both. Now, if he's just saying James doesn't know what he's talking about when he uses the word justification, okay. But he said that it was theologically loaded after James uses it here. That's a, that, that, if you're attributing all this meaning to James, it's loaded. He's saying this is a primitive word. Now this is actually compatible with what I teach in that this is what they believed in Jerusalem. That ju they, their view of justification was different than what Paul brought. It's not a compliment to Paul's teaching though. It needed to be corrected. But the other thing he says is that Paul's declaration of justification is what's called forensic. Now, forensic has the ring of the of a law court. And just to be sure, I did talk to ChatGPT about this. I said, when theologians speak about forensic justification, what's their definition of the word forensic? It's not a scriptural term. It's a traditional term, but what's the definition? When theologians talk about forensic justification, they're using the term forensic in a way that's a bit different from the common use in the fields of criminal justice. Here, forensic refers to a legal or courtroom setting. Okay, so it's a legal setting, it's courtroom setting. That's why I say it's, it's got, it's loaded. It's about legal proceedings and the declaration of someone's status by an authority, in this case, God. Forensic justification refers to the act of God declaring a believer righteous in his sight. This declaration is not based on believers' own righteousness or deeds, but on the righteousness of Christ, which is credited to them. This concept is central to many Christian theological traditions, especially those emphasizing salvation by grace through faith alone. Okay, is it fair, this is me, to say that the word forensic puts it in the context of sin. Why? Of course, because it's a legal proceeding in a court. Yes, that's a fair way to put it. The term forensic in the context of forensic justification indeed places the concept within the realm of sin and righteousness. It's about addressing the problem of sin 
and the legal standing of humans before God. In a forensic or legal sense, justification deals with the guilt and penalty of sin, emphasizing believers declared righteous, meaning regarded as free from the guilt of sin through faith in Christ. This legal declaration is based on the merits of Christ's righteousness and, and his atoning sacrifice rather than the individual's own works. Now that's all put it in the context of sin. Um, I said, okay, so Paul teaches justification is not only about sin, but it is also about securing blessing, the inheritance, the sonship, and the reward, not just of ourselves, but Christ himself, who is the seed to whom all the promises are made. It's actually his justification as our representative that has nothing to do with sin. Abraham was given the gospel in Genesis 12, and it has no mention of sin, only blessing. So is this forensic? Watch how quickly it, it picked up on this. David, you are uh, touching on a profound, comprehensive view of justification that goes beyond the mere legal declaration of being righteous, moving into a realm of relationship, inheritance, identity in Christ. In Paul's teachings, justification indeed encompasses not only the removal of sin's penalty, but the securing of blessing, inheritance, sonship, and reward. These are bestowed not on the basis of our merit, but through union with Christ, who is the ultimate recipient of the promises made to God. This is exactly what I teach. It inferred all that from one paragraph. The, base, the cases of Abraham, as mentioned in Genesis 12 and discussed by Paul, especially in Romans 4 and Galatians 3, is a prime example. It immediately knows that I'm talking about Romans 4 and Galatians 3. Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness independent of the law and before the giving of the law, which indeed did not center on sin but the promise and blessing. This blessing extends to all who share in Abraham's faith, pointing to the reality that justification, while forensic in its declaration of righteousness, also involves a deep covenantal relationship with God, carries with it inherent sonship in this broader sense while forensic justification primarily addresses the legal aspect of our standing before God, the biblical concept is taught. The biblical concept is taught by Paul certainly encompasses more. It brings us into a family relationship with God, secures our blessings in Christ, identifies us with Christ, who is himself the primary heir of all God's promises. This relationship is a uh, relational aspect intertwined with the forensic highlights the full scope of justification as only dealing not only dealing with sin but also securing a position and inheritance okay now what it's saying is that yes forensic really implies the legal definition the declaration of righteousness and yes it's couched in the context of sin and the removal of guilt in a law court but it's clear from Romans 4 and Galatians 3, which is what I've been saying all along. It do, I didn't prime it for this. I just went in and had the conversation. There's no history before this other than I've got a system prompt that it knows my name. But it immediately knows what I'm talking about. And yes, I'm amazed at the model, but what that is because it's got the, the King James Bible as its index memorized. And I did a video about a year ago about how the Bible is the first document that was created for a language model to parse because it's self-referencing, cross-referencing, it's an organized message system organized by keywords and tags where God uses them all uses them all consistently to create an index of every, which you know we've used the Strong's Concordance for hundreds of years but the reason that exists is because of the way God organized the message system and it is so good for a language model to be able to parse and quickly be brought up to speed theological anyway sorry not I'm on a tangent there but the it quickly and immediately knew what I was talking about that there's a difference between so-called forensic justification which is in the context of sin and guilt in the courtroom and the biblical full scope that Paul talks about from Galatians 3 and Romans 4 and that's what I've been teaching on this channel for years that look the redefinition of justification from James that the free gracers are using strips justification of all of its contents okay now this is what this guy's saying this is exactly what I'm talking about. 
He says, justification for Paul is the moment we are made forensically right with faith, with God by faith alone. But James doesn't speak to this. No, he does not. For James, justification is when, for a saved person, God acknowledges and rewards living service and action done in faith. So he calls that justification by works. Watch this. Nothing this does, noting that this does not reconcile James with Paul. They're speaking to two separate issues and saying two distinct things. No reconciliation is required. Also, yes, watch this. Abraham was justified by works when he offered up Isaac. And this is when God intervened and said, I know you fear God, seeing you've not withheld your only son from me. And, and I said by myself, I've sworn because you've done this and not withheld your son, your only son, that in blessing I'll bless you because you've done this thing, I will bless thee. Okay, so what he's saying is that this is God promising Abraham the inheritance and the reward because of his work. Okay, but Paul teaches that the reward and the blessing and the inheritance came upon Abraham through faith, not when he offered Isaac, but when he was initially justified before he was circumcised. And when he describes the maturing of Abraham's faith, he doesn't mention offering Isaac. He mentions that Abraham waxed strong in faith, giving glory to God, not counting his own body as dead or the barrenness of Sarah's womb, but counting that he God calls those things that are not as though they are and gives life to the dead is able to do what he promised. And that there is not talking about the forgiveness of sins. It's talking about the blessing and the reward and the inheritance. So in Genesis 12, God promised to bless Abraham. And that blessing was a gospel, according to Galatians 3. This is really important. Because the devil is playing games with people, with these sophisticated doctrines that are totally unscriptural. Look what he says. For the, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify. Now it says heathen there. You assume it's the Gentile nations, but remember, Abraham was not a Jew. And yes, he was called out, but he's the Jews were also justified by faith. Okay, Seeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you all the nations will be blessed. That's the gospel. There's no reference to sin. And he's talking about justification. Right? He therefore ministers you, the Spirit does miracles among you. Does he do it? By the works of the law, the hearing of faith. He, even as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, know you therefore that they were of faith of the children of Abraham. The scripture seeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached the gospel to Abraham, saying, In thee all the nations will be blessed. Now, is he talking about forensic justification only? The forgiveness of sins? No, he's talking about the blessing. So then those who are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham, for as many as are work of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, curses everyone who doesn't continue in the works of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evidence, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith. The man that does them shall live them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us, is is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through faith, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, he just tells us that the, the Spirit, the blessing, is the Spirit, which is who? God himself. Remember what he said to Abraham, fear not, Abraham, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. Brethren, I speak not as the matter of men, though it's a man's covenant, yet if it's confirmed, no man disannuls or adds to. He's saying that the law that came 400 years later cannot disqualify the heir. But the heir is one, not many. Now, this is a mystery that was not revealed before Paul. Now, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He says, not to seeds as many, but as of one to your seed, Christ. And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before in Christ, the law, which was 400 years later, cannot disannul. For the inheritance is of law, it's of no of more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. What therefore serves the law? It was added because of transgressions that the seed should come to whom the promise is made. So when Christ came, 
the one who is the heir of the promises, he is able to enter into them. And he does so on our behalf. And in, and in that sense, Christ was justified. I had somebody on my wall again today say, no, Christ wasn't justified, he never sinned. This is a sin-conscious definition of justification. No, justification is the qualification for everything. And Christ, as our representative man, the last Adam, was justified, okay, for to enter in as the seed of David to hit the promises that were made to him. Um, now, a mediator is not of one, but God is one, is the law against the promise of God. Okay, uh, talking about how we're all concluded under sin, that the promise of faith uh, might come be given to them belief. What is it? Is it just that we're, our sins are forgiven? The law told us we're sinners, and now the grace forgives us our sins, but you still have to work for your blessing and reward? No. Before faith came, we were shut up under the law, shut up under f the faith which after to which should be revealed. Therefore, the law was a schoolmaster. And the word there is speaking about how a rich family would have a steward that would teach their children who were the heirs about the estate. The law was our schoolmaster. That's the that's what that the Greek word is, the background. That we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we're no longer under the schoolmaster. Where you're all children of God. See, it's not you're just you're all just forgiven. Now you have to earn sonship. No, you're all the children of God by faith in Christ. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, now here's the mystery of Christ. Have put on Christ. There's neither Jew or Greek, there's neither bond or free, neither male or female. You are all one in Christ. And if you're Christ, then you're Abraham's seed. Why? Because there's many seeds? No, because there's one seed, and it's Christ, the heir of the promise. And he shares his promise, his blessing, freely with the co-heirs. This is all Pauline truth that had not been revealed before. This is called the mystery of Christ. And if you say James knew this, you're lying, or you don't know the Bible. Uh, because Paul tells us that it wasn't declared to the prophets or the sons of men. It was revealed uniquely to him by the ascended Christ, which is why a lot of people call Paul a false apostle and accuse him of Gnosticism, because he had special revelation. But his gospel was not learned by flesh and blood. He received it from the ascended Christ as a unique set of truth that governs this age, the dispensation of the grace of God, which is the revelation of the mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory that doesn't just forgive us our sins and give us forensic justification. It secures the blessing and the promise, but that blessing is not our blessing. It's Christ's. It's his blessing. It's the blessing promised to the seed. And we are joined to him by faith. Okay. Now I said, so he had said, just to review, that justification is forensic the way Paul talks about it. Now the way Yankee Arnold says it is that's a free gift for you to go to heaven. But that's what it really means, is when they talk about forensic, it's just a legal declaration that your sins are forgiven. And so now you can go to heaven when you die. But it does not secure the blessing. That they get from James. So the bulk of the Christian life and all of its motivation is rooted in a different kind of justification, which he admits here is primitive, right? And before it was loaded theologically loaded. Remember he said that the two legitimate uses of one ordinary word before it was theologically loaded. No, it is not an ordinary word. It's theologically loaded when James says it does not save. Faith alone does not save. And when James teaches that just Abraham was justified by works, it is no longer a primitive, ordinary word. When you say even the demons believe and tremble and faith without works is dead, and it's being alone and cannot save. I'm sorry, no, that is not a ordinary word. Not theologically loaded. It is loaded at that point. And it's pointed right at you. <laughs> okay, but I basically reiterated this, but the revelation we have from Paul is that our justification is in Christ himself, and it's his blessing and reward that we receive. He's the seed to whom the promises are made. Abraham did what he did. Now, this is talking about the offering of Isaac. Knowing that God would raise Isaac from the dead and receiving him back as a figure of Christ, knowing that everything is tied up in the promise concerning the seed, right? If Abraham had not done that, would you say his faith is dead? 
and even the demons believe and tremble, and that this faith did not justify? You can't say that. You can't say that God would not have given him the reward if he had not offered Isaac. Then the justification that Paul proclaims over Abraham and based on Genesis 15 is not true. It's null and void. Now, Paul's argument is, look, nothing later after the covenant is made can disannul it or make the promise or the inheritance of no effect. Now, that's the law. He's talking about the law 400 years later in Galatians 3. He's saying, look, that can't come along later when a covenant is ratified. What happened in Genesis 15 when God said, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward? Abraham said, then what will you give me considering that I go childless and Eliezer is going to be my heir? And then he said, take the heifer and make the burnt offering. And so Abraham made the, prepared the sacrifice, but then God put him into a deep sleep and rendered him passive. Then what happened? The everlasting covenant was confirmed between God and Christ which Paul refers to in Galatians 3 and in Hebrews, if you want to say that Paul wrote it, which I do believe. But that's when he said, surely he could swear by no greater. He swore by himself and confirmed it with an oath and said, surely blessing, I will bless you. For when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself saying, surely blessing, I will bless you and multiplying, I will multiply you. Justification, qualification for the promise was while he was asleep. He believed, and the co covenant was ratified then. And Paul's argument in Hebrews 6, For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath and confirmation to them is an end of all strife. But God, willing to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel, meaning it cannot change, confirmed it with an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we have strong consolation who fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. But this is justification. Justification is when God takes your faith and says you're, you are the qualified heir. It's not just the forgiveness of sins. There's no mention of sin in any of the promises concerning justification to Abraham. That's important because, again, what's happened is that people have a gutted, impoverished view of justification that's sin-focused and only focused on sin. And it's law-oriented. And it is a legal court declaration that you're not guilty. And yet, they still hold the punishment over the believer's head. Okay, so there's irony there. But look at Romans 4. We saw Galatians 3 that he said that the law, which came 400 years later, could not disannul the promise and make it of no effect or disqualify the heirs. A covenant, once it's ratified, cannot be changed, altered, or added to. And there was a covenant in Genesis 15 which our justification is based on. But here again in Romans 4, and in Hebrews 6, he makes it clear again. Look, it's a man's covenant. You can't change it. How much more God, willing to show the immutability of his counsel, to give full assurance to the heirs, confirmed it with an oath, saying, I will forgive your sins. No, saying, blessing, I will bless you. The, so here it says, blessed is the man to whom God will not impute sin. But does this come only on the circumcision for we say that faith was reckoned to abraham for righteousness how was it reckoned when it was uncircumcision or uncircumcision uh, circumcision sorry and he received the sign of circumcision to seal the righteousness of faith which he had yet being uncircumcised when was he's establishing the timing and it's very important that you understand the timing of justification for abraham to understand that it's by faith apart from works he received the sign of circumcision to seal the righteousness of faith which he had being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all who believe, though they not be circumcised, and the righteousness of be imputed to them also, but also who walk in the steps of our faith, of that faith of our, I gotta get glasses on, of our father Abraham, which he had yet being uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or his seed, which is Christ, through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void. The promise is not a fact. It doesn't say if those who are of the law have their sins forgiven and go to heaven. It says they're heirs. Faith, if they are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise of no effect, because the law works wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, it's of faith that it might be grace. The end of the promise of blessing 
might be secure to all the seed, not only that which is of the law, but that which is of faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Then he talks about what kind of faith. He called him the father of many nations, which is the blessing and the multiplication. Before him whom he believed, even God who quickens the dead and calls those things that are not as though they are, who against hope believed in hope, that he might be the father of many nations, according to that which is spoken, so shall your seed, which you saw as Christ, be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body as dead, though he was a hundred years old. It doesn't, this is 30 years before the offering of Isaac. Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and having been fully persuaded what he promised, he was able to perform. Therefore it was imputed to him as righteousness. Not was it written to his sake alone, but also, also for us, to whom it shall be imputed, imputed, if we believe on him that raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered for our offenses, but he was raised for our justification, and justification is more than just the forgiveness of sins, just as if I never sinned. What shall we say, this is the beginning of the chapter, that Abraham our father has, pertaining to the flesh has found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he has nothing to glory, or he'd, he'd have something to glory, but he's not. He does, he's not justified by works, but not before God. For what says the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works is the reward, not reckoned of debt, of grace, but of debt. Now to him that works is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him who works not, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted to him as righteousness. And yes, David does describe the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness without work, saying that blesses their iniquities forgiven and their sins are covered. That's true, it does cover that. But it's much more. The blessing of the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin includes the reward and the inheritance and the promise. Okay, and this was made as a covenant to Christ, who is the seed to whom all the promises are made. And what Romans reveals is that we are the many sons of God who are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ and glorified and are co-heirs together with him and have received the spirit of promise, the spirit of sonship, crying, Abba, Father, bearing witness that we are children of God and heirs, joint heirs with Jesus Christ, heirs of God. Okay, now when Paul deals with practical matters such as having faith of Jesus with respect to persons, he would have called that carnality in 1 Corinthians, right? He said, you're walking as mere men saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Apollos. What are these people other than servants given to you? Don't you know that all things are yours? So he tells the carnal believers that they're walking. He says, you're walking as mere men. When he talks about bringing their matters before Gentile law courts, he says, don't you know that you'll judge angels? And when he talks about even the sin of fornication, he says, don't you know your members are members of Christ and that you are, he was joined to the Lord as one spirit, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, you're making the members of Christ the members of a harlot. James says even the believing, believers, even the demons believe and tremble and faith without works is dead. Okay, so this guy is saying that James is dealing with the word justification is forensic is not forensic and it's not theologically loaded. It's it's ordinary, right? And and he says Abraham was justified by works, and that this work is what secured the reward and the inheritance for Abraham. Think about that. He's saying that the salvation of you and me which was contingent on the blessing that belongs to Christ was contingent actually on Abraham's works and Abraham was justified by works when he offered Isaac and that's why God blessed him that's why God gave him Christ that's why God made him the father of many nations and blessed him and multiplied the seed which is Christ was because of Abraham's works. That's what they're teaching. This is wordplay. Whether this guy knows, he's fully sincere. But he's talking about a justification by faith unto reward and blessing that is unscriptural and overturns Paul. And he says they don't need to be reconciled. 
And he's, he admits that they're talking about two different kinds of justification. Now, this is the kind of justification that the so-called free gracers really believe in, which is where they generate their doctrine of punishments and rewards. Okay, so I said, the revelation we have from Paul is that our justification is in Christ himself, and it's his blessing and reward we receive. He is the seed to whom all the promises are made. Abraham did what he did, knowing that God would raise Isaac from the dead, bringing, receiving him back as a figure of Christ, to get that from Hebrews 11, knowing that everything is tied up in God's promise. He knew he was acting out prophecy, too. He said, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen, right? If Abraham had not done that, do you think that, would you say his faith was dead, and even the demons believe and tremble, and that his faith did not justify so until Abraham did that, his faith was dead, and he's just like a demon? No, you wouldn't say that. Would you say that he wasn't going to be the heir? See, what he's saying is that the fact that he did that, and so God said, because you've done this thing, I'm going to bless you, means that Abraham was justified by works. And if he hadn't done that, he would not have been justified by work. What he's saying, we are justified by works. He doesn't understand that this is not... This is, you can't make a different justification from James for the blessing without taking the kingdom away from Christ and also a, away from us and gutting justification of all of its contents. And this is why I talk about a stripped justification. That for them, justification is just going to heaven when you died. It's a forensic declaration in the court of law that you're not guilty and, and your sins are forgiven, and yet you still need temporal salvation from the punishment for your sins, and to earn, you need to work to earn the blessing and the reward. And they teach that, or at least imply, that if Abraham had not done that, the, the covenant would be disannulled. Even though Paul argues and makes it really clear that once the covenant is annulled, nothing, no condition can be later added. If he said, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to offer Isaac. I won't do it. Does that mean that salvation would never come because the blessing of Abraham would never come and we would be just screwed and God would not have Christ exalted, seated at the right hand of God? You're making the covenant that God made with Christ, the everlasting covenant, contingent on works. It's an accursed gospel. It's just so sophisticated that people don't know that what they're, what's happening because they use all these fancy words that now you have to use complex theological language to diffuse, and when you do that, you lose everybody because they're not capable of following. Intellectually, they're just not capable of understanding what you're saying. I'm losing a lot of subs right now simply because of an inability to understand what we're talking about. There's nothing I can do about that, except keep explaining. Um, okay, Paul tells us very clearly in Romans 4, justification secures not only the forgiveness of sins, is my answer, but also the reward, the blessing, and the inheritance, which is God himself. The promise of Christ's multiplication is realized in the blessing of Abraham, the promise of the Spirit, Galatians 3, we're baptized into Christ and put him on. This is our qualification, not of works. This is the mystery of Christ, mystery, which God, or which Paul was uniquely commissioned to reveal. And James did not know at the time he wrote his letter, because it had not yet been disclosed to the sons of men. This teaching comes from an impoverished view. This teaching, what he's talking about with this kind of justification, is based on an impoverished view of justification and a disregard of what the scripture tells us about the theological trouble in Jerusalem and amounts to a gutting of justification and its benefits that are described in Paul's epistles. When Paul talks about the faith that secured the reward, the inheritance and the blessing, he spoke of Abraham waxing strong in faith, counting not his own body as dead in the barrenness of Sarah's womb and hoping against hope in the promise of the seed, ultimately Christ, but represented by Isaac. Jay is speaking of another kind of justification by works, but Paul excludes us from it categorically when he tells us that if the reward was is not a matter of debt, otherwise it would no more be of grace, that nothing good dwells in the flesh, and flesh cannot be justified. As you said, there is no reconciliation between James and Paul. But if you understand Paul's teaching, you know that you're not qualified for the justification that James theoretically speaks of. 
If you insist on taking James' teaching on justification as some kind of compliment to Paul, you have to overturn Paul's doctrine. That's the whole point. They're overturning the doctrine of justification, building it on James, trying to harmonize them in a way or deal with them in a grace way and say, he's talking about something different. And then they take all the blessings of Abraham's seed, which is Christ, and give it to Abraham based on works and say, you have to work for it too. It is an accursed gospel. It's another gospel. It's accursed. Okay? So it's really critical. And if this wasn't what was being taught, then there would be no need to go this much into James and say, what is the history behind James and all that? But it's because of this kind of twisting of the scriptures and sophistry and wordplay and pulling the wool over people's eyes and deceiving them and setting them up for the abuse and the beatings that you have to get to the, the root of the problem. They are basing, they're excusing themselves to do all this and legitimizing their abuse of the saints. I'm not talking about this guy. I'm talking about the institutional system that does this. They're legitimizing abuse of the saints, slapping them in the face and taking everything from them taking their crown, judging them unworthy of their prize. Again, James addresses sin very differently than Paul because his view of justification is very different. Paul tells them, he, what he does is he extols their exalted position in Christ and motivates them with it. Not They try to say, how do you know that you're saved without works? That's all, Paul's, that's all James is saying is show me your faith by your works. Paul is speaking to the church at Corinth and all their works said they're not saved. James would have said your faith is dead. Even the demons believe and tremble. Paul says, don't you know you'll judge angels? All things are yours. How can he do that? Because the criteria for understanding whether someone's justified is faith alone apart from works. You look for the faith. He said you're enriched in all utterance because the testimony of Christ is confirmed in you. That's what we go by to recognize who's saved and who's not, who's justified, who's qualified, who's an heir, who's blessed. And you don't get to tell the sons of God that they are not blessed and they are not going to be rewarded and exclude them from anything that justification secures by splitting justification in half and calling this one forensic and that. That is just wordplay. They are twisting the scriptures and inventing heresy right in front of you. Um, so please take the time to understand this go back and listen to my Romans 4 and 5 teachings that I've done recently that get into this in depth what we have in justification the good news is so much better than you think and it's worth fighting for no matter how many pictures they make of me with devil horns and all this stuff alright I had to go I know this was long I know it's weighty matters and that's going to lose people but I'm going to keep speaking to these things